Welcome once again to The Breakfast on PLOS TV Africa. It's now time for Off the Press. Uh, we have a quick review of the stories making headlines across Nigeria this Thursday morning. I'm starting with the daily independent newspapers. And the big one should be on your screen in a few seconds. The big one there is talking about the, um, of course, one of the things I just mentioned, the state of emergency in Anambra State. It says federal government gets knocks over emergency rule threat in Anambra. Arneza says, state of emergency threat and embarrassment. Uh, plan reaffirms discriminatory posture of government, says Pandef. Northeast, more qualified for emergency rule, uh, Obani tells federal government. Also, CUPP alleges plots to derail 2023 poll, Scottul Electoral Act Amendment. Still on the Daily Independent, 10% of political class feasting on Nigeria's Commonwealth, says the NLC. Songwo Lu names Bagada housing estate after Ndubisi Kanu. Uh, governor, ex-governors, Nadeko chieftains, Navy and others honor ex-Milad. Uh, and also APC heading for implosion and extinction. Party youths warn, insist no imposition during national convention. NCC disqualifies Nigerians below 18 years from owning SIM cards. And uh, we can also find on the Daily Independent, more borrowing will trail 6.258 trillion naira uh, 2022 budget deficit, says federal government. PDP convention, Mark Saraki reject party national chairmanship. Moving on from the Daily Independent, let's go to the Punch newspapers. High budget deficit, don't harm our future, experts warn government. Federal government plans more loans. Naira will fall further, inflation would rise, debt servicing will worsen, say experts. And it says government will continue to borrow to finance projects. No money, says minister. Everywhere I go, I'm asked, about, I'm asked to contest 2023 presidential seat, says Kalu. And also this morning, court summons Fanny Kayode's ex-wife of alleged document falsification. Female ex-NIS officer arrested for scamming job seekers and collecting 34 million naira. Can reconstitutes prayer panel against killings, kidnappings, and others. And two Randy Ekiti men remanded for scaling fence and raping a 16-year-old girl in a mother's room. We can also find on the punch this morning, Lagos Abdelkota Highway. Protesters threaten to ground Ogun. Issue 21-day ultimatum. Federal government considers taking states to Supreme Court over value-added tax saga. And also Anambra Killings, PDP alleges rigging plot Obiano kicks as federal government mauls emergency rule. And uh, I think we can uh, move from the punch now, see what we can find on the Daily Trust newspapers. Federal government mauls state of emergency in Anambra. Malami confirmed our worst fears, says the state government. Take order to Zamfara. Katsina, Abga says. And also APC planning to rig, that's from the PDP. Biafra agitation, madness, counter groups uh, likely, says Umahi. And also Nigeria and others to benefit as Google in invest 410 billion naira in Africa's global transformation. Federal government to borrow 6.258 trillion naira to finance 2022 budget. Still on the daily trust, 37 days after, Buhari yet to appoint new ministers from Kanu and Taraba. Scores killed. Houses burnt as gunmen attack Zamfara village. And uh, mixed reactions as NCC sets 18-year age limit for SIM ownership and others in draft regulation. Finally, on the leadership newspapers this morning. On insecurity, federal government malls state of emergency in Anambra. Insists November 6th uh, governorship election must hold. It will worsen security situation, says Ohaneze. Federal government constitutionally empowered to declare emergency rules, as uh, our lawyers are speaking. And the Anambra case does not suggest that, and that's from the PDP. Also on the leadership this morning, pension uh, managers have diverted billions of uh, naira, says the EFCC. NLC opts for living wage, declares minimum pay dead. And we can also find that POS and mobile money transactions hit 9.7 trillion naira. Uh, push to throw PDP presidential ticket open intensifies. Um, and I think uh, President Wamadubai presents a 16.39 trillion naira 2022 budget today. Those are the big stories on the uh, leadership newspapers. Good morning to our guest, Mr. Ezekiel Nyayetok.
a public affairs analyst. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, good morning. Always a pleasure to be with you. All right. Of course, the big one that has made headlines across all the papers is uh, the controversy concerning the state of emergency in Anambra State. Uh, a lot of people have spoken against it, but the federal government, of course, you know, still playing with the idea. What are your thoughts on this? I think that um, it's very unfortunate, absolutely um, unfortunate. There's what you call emotional intelligence in governance, and it comes down to what I've always talked about. We, we, the way forward in governance is, is cerebral governance. Governance is an extremely important affair that you need the brightest and the best to take the most informed decision in time per time. The Bible says all things are lawful, but not all things are expedient. If you read the spirit of the time, you will understand that the insecurity on the southeast comes from a primary source. We may have other secondary sources, but the primary source is that of feeling alienated, that of feeling not wanted that of feeling like second-class citizens, that of feeling that we are really not part of this business. We are like um, passengers. We are not like, um, you know, principal actors or participants or stakeholders. And if you come to terms with that primary, you know, concern, then everything you do should be to the end of dispelling that notion there could have been something that they misunderstood. So you give so much time to show that they are important, they are stakeholders. When you have done that on the first hand, then you seemingly take the wind of the sail because as much as they are very enlightened, you know, Southeasterners who are really not happy with what IPOP is doing because their businesses are being interrupted and everything, they are also at the back of their minds not happy that the federal government treats them the way they do. And what has just happened shows the, the complete lack of emotional intelligence on the part of the, the attorney general. And there's a posturing that he really needs to be called to attention, called to, called to order. The, 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 you know, the, the, the attorney general, to my mind, to my mind, I may be wrong, and I hope I'm wrong, I pray I'm wrong, has this impression of not being a servant, but of a lord, of a master, of, of being somebody that, that, that should be, I don't know the word to use, that will not be extremely derogatory. So he talks down on people. So he has this posturing that is like, he's doing us a favor, and he's wrong. So if, if, if you look at, Everybody has said the same thing, so I'm just going to sound like a broken record. Look at what's going on in, in the Northeast. Look at Zamfara. Look at Katsina. Look at the state where the governor has come up and said, look, this is not past me or I don't fit again. And he said, it's absolutely nothing. And then Anambra is about the whole election. And you are as much as imagining, not to talk of verbalizing, you know, uh, you know, emergency rule in that state. Exactly what did he want to achieve? It beat my imagination exactly what Mr. Malami intended to achieve. On the flip side of it, I think that it's absolutely important that the Southeasterners ask themselves exactly what they are doing to themselves. Forget about Malami. I think that time has come for that conversation to hold. I know it's starting to hold. I know it's coming late in the day. But I also believe it's better late than never. Because if we get inside the house and start to talk objectively and, you know, looking at each other in the eyeball, I think that there's a lot of absolutely stupid, reckless, irresponsible things being done where you are smiting your nose to spite your face. It doesn't add up. So I think that, like, there's a Greek adage that says, you know, you would understand. It simply means as you caution the hawks, you should also caution the chicks. 
I think this is a two-way thing right. that we must and, and um, take that, together. Quickly also share your thoughts on those who have, you know, seen this and, of course, uh, brought up conspiracy theories that this is just the government's uh, plan to, um, you know, well some, well, some person's plan to steal the election. And that might be the reason they are thinking about this. These are all just theories flying left and right. Um, but do yeah. you agree that it gives space for those theories? That theory is not unfounded. You see, with all due respect to my very, very, very cerebral, nice, intelligent, articulate, patriotic friends that are in the APC, I think the APC is largely controlled by people who just don't think with their brain. They don't think. It's like, you know, maybe we'll come to it where you talk of NCC trying to put age regulation on who owns SIM cards. Maybe we'll come to it. I really wish we'll come to it. But the thing is that these people think of governance and how to win more like thugs, a lot of them. And that's not the way. You win governance democratically by superior argument. That's what democracy is all about. Appeal to the people. Come to the people. Give them superior argument on why they should change and follow you. I don't know why anybody would want to join APC at this point in time. Because all indices, I'm not an APC member. I'm not a PDP member. I belong to the third group where, you, where ADC is. But, and, and I'm telling our party, we just got to come cerebral. We got to come as a clean alternative because these people are not thinking. This is not governance. Mm. It's not governance. So right. I think that it's not, it's not beyond them to think that way of um, you know, just causing some troubles here and there so that they can now create this state of emergency and then bring about, you know, them being in control to conduct the election after we their coup. That is the more reason the Southeasterners should wise up and sit up and think straight and re-strategize. All right, Ms. Ayatok, Ms. Ayatok I, I now want you, because you already mentioned it, let's now go to talking about the NCC's new, um, you know, regulation and saying that only 18-year-olds and above can own SIM cards. Um, do you think that's, you know, a good move? Is the most, is the most disingenuous, most thoughtless, the most provoking thing I've heard in a long time. Do you know our people in government don't have, a lot of them don't have the capacity to discern the signs of the times. Technology is the future of the world. We are thinking of how to get telephones, which is the smallest part of technology, to primary school children. You are thinking of limiting age limit to 18 years to own a phone. In 2023, in 2021, this is preposterous. Absolutely mind-boggling how somebody in this age can think that way. It's about mental laziness. What we should be thinking of is how do we get telephones into the hands of primary school children? What we should be thinking of is how do we get laptops as a state policy to every tertiary, tertiary institution um, child? What we should be thinking of is how can we make programming, coding, you know, a part of the curriculum in secondary school, if not primary school. What we should be thinking of is, okay, there are problems if because of abuse, 419 and things like, how do we create an ecosystem that isolates these people? How do we? That's when you bring thinkers into government and governance. These people are called pro, you know, solution providers. These are people who, 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 whose brain is charged constantly. These are the people that should be in government. And they say, okay, why don't we do like this? Can we have parents buying SIMs for their children below a certain age so that there are special SIMs that are cloned? It means that once your parent buys this phone for you, whatever activities that you do with your phone reflect on the phone of your sponsor or of your parent, in which case they have access and you cannot block them to the sites that you watch on the network 
uh, or, or yes, or, or they have access to the mails that come to you. They have access to, they, they, you know, just that thought will make the children, I don't even know how somebody of 15 years is a child. How are we even thinking of our youth? That is why somebody at 45 calls himself a youth. Somebody at 50 is a youth. It's, 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 it's you know, <laughs> weird, you know, because I, I know that, and these are some of the statements that I also saw yesterday, that, you know, in certain parts of the country, people, uh, you know, they're still being able to get married at 16 and at 15. And so, you know, how, you know, do you not see that person as a child, but, you know, you, you see an 18-year-old, um, you know, and of, and, of course, the NCC is uh, banning people from getting phone, uh, phones at that age. Um, and also, you know, talking about innovation and, you know, how we, we need to get more young people um, access to the Internet. Smartphones, you know, are very, very important in, in today's age. For those who can't afford laptops, they can still do research on their smartphones. On their even phones. at 14 and 15 years. Well, you know, no, you know I, 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 I pray God gives me opportunity to, to live at a certain capacity. There will be laws, statements, and thinking patterns that will make other states to sit up. Because we really need to recalibrate. We need to reset with our thinking. Our thinking has become completely anachronistic and not in times with the times. You know, technology is, I look forward to a president who would want to be the minister, not of petroleum, but of the ICT. Because that's the future of Nigeria. Well. Anybody that is still thinking oil has no business being in government at a certain leadership position. Right. We need to L let's move away. bring back governance to cerebral governance. Yeah, l l let's move to the punch now. There's something on the punch there. It's also one of the big stories um, saying, uh, don't harm our future. Experts warn government. Federal government plans more loans. Uh, they're talking about borrowing more than 6 trillion naira to support the uh, 2022 budget. Um, so yeah, talk, it, feels, it seems rather like uh, we may never end, you know, this borrowing trend. You know, we, we won't end the borrowing trend because the mentality of the borrowers. I once talked with a governor on a very sensitive topic, you know, long time ago or some time ago so that you don't place any administration. And he said something that really, really hit me hard and bothered me for a long time. He said, my brother, that's what the person used to address me as, my brother, let's leave this thing alone. Though. I have less than four years to go. When I leave, others, I don't want to start something that... Uh, and, and that is the mindset of the people in office. They don't think of our future. No, they don't. They think of the present. And Nigerians are not helping matters. We celebrate the bridges built. What did you do? Imagine a man who comes in and spends eight years laying foundation on education. At the end of the eight years, that foundation that he laid from day one because he was very focused, he might not be credited with the bridges he built, the roads he built, how many Nigerians will come to a, hail him for laying a foundation for a sustainable future? Look at Awolowo today. Awolowo is celebrated on account of what he did on education. That's why sometimes back, I was talking to this man, uh, and, I, and I hope that he has a chance to really talk to Nigerians uh, at the risk of seemingly uh, talking about him. This man in, 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 in Kano, Kwankwaso, the things he did in education were mind-boggling, but who is talking about it? But we talk about the bridges. So I think that the media should actually come to set a new conversation on sustainable you know, development. Look at the policies of every governor, rate them and see who is a here and now governor and who is a leader who thinks of the next generation and not a politician who thinks of the next election. Can we come to profile the activities of government and governors and dispensations and see who laid a foundation for a better state, a better Nigeria, and then 
help people and encourage people to go foundational. You know, you know, I'm an architect, and there's a structure I did in Jabi. My brother, there, we had about 52 piles. What went into the ground was 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 mind-boggling, but nobody knows it. All they see is the structure that is coming up, but nobody talks about the foundation. Who is laying the foundation for Nigeria? And do we know that such a man might not have the, the superstructure built? All he will be able to do is build a foundation. When he builds a foundation, who has come to interrogate that, the thinking pattern, so that he will be hailed for building the foundation and others held to make sure they build on that foundation, the superstructure, and everybody that builds an extra floor is hailed, including the man that builds foundation. It's a thinking pattern and process that we need to come to terms with as a nation for us to have sustainable development. All right. Now let's uh, move away from there and then react to something that the NLC is saying. It's on the Daily Independent, top right corner. And it says that 10% of political class feasting on Nigeria's Commonwealth. And that's from the uh, Nigerian Labour Congress. That's very, very correct. And we really don't seem to know what is going on, what governance is all about. I'll tell you this. Somebody says that, um, you know, the, the, the most uh, prosperous, or not prosperous, that's not a good word, that the richest, the wealthiest Nigerians are not politicians, they're civil servants. Okay? And that is correct only to an extent in the sense that they are sitting, when they talk of juicy, you know, ministries and things like that, those that are doing the roads, those that are doing the capital projects, now the same comes to politicians. I had a very, very heated debate, you know, just yesterday in my state when I asked, a, somebody asked the question, who owns the economy of Akwaibom State? You'll be shocked to know that between the last dispensation and this one, we have spent close to 8 trillion, trillion naira in our state, which used to be at the stage more than the national budget. But where is it reflected? Can we really find, you know, there's something that uh, Madam Okonjo Iweala said. She said she's speaking as a developmental economist, that she's not been able to see 20% of what has been collected on ground in a certain state. Let me not be too specific. She said she's speaking not just as a CNE or Minister of Finance, but as a developmental economist. And that is what is going on in Nigeria. Certain Nigerians are, hum are, are I don't know the word, they are, they are stupendously rich. They, they, are, they, are, they, are, they, are, they are in they are well wealthy to the point of insanity, right? So that 10%, as far as I'm concerned, is a very generous, I'll say maybe 5% of Nigerians are really feasting. There are some people that don't know where to store dollars, I'm told, or uh, it is speculated in this, in this, in this, our same country. They don't know where to store dollars. I'm not talking of Naira, I'm talking of dollars. So it is that that bad. And then this government, I feel very, they, I hope there will be a day I'll actually say what's on my mind concerning Mr. President. Because I didn't vote for him, but I had a lot of confidence in him as an individual. I just thought that the, the work of the office was too overwhelming for him at this point of his age and then um, health and all that. But in terms of a person, nobody would have any, 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 any question about his integrity to a great extent before now. But as of today, let me reserve that for another day. But what's going on in this government under his watch is, 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 is a sin. It's a crime. It's, it's almost unforgivable. All right, and then finally, I think we can wrap up with talking about the PDP convention. It says, uh, PDP convention, Mark Saraki reject party national uh, chairmanship. Uh, the, of course, uh, conversation has really been about, you know, you know who we eventually, or if they will eventually pick a southern candidate for 2023. And, of course, that, you know, would come from whoever it is that they pick for their, you know, as a party's chairman. You know, that would give insights as to who the candidate would be. Um, so share your thoughts on, you know, where this is going or where this seems to be going. You see, there's something about the PDP that um, they have learned from APC. When um, 
President Buhari was chosen as a candidate of the APC, I had a lot of talks. I remember one of my senator friends, I wish I could call his name, we had a, a hard talk in Hilton for about two hours standing outside. And at the end, I said, you went to King's College. I expect better from you. It was a hard talk. And he just said, my brother, my brother, this is about winning election. This is about winning election. Let's win first. When we win, we'll know what to do. PDP is also thinking that way. All this issue of it's fair, it's not fair, it should be torn, it should be not. PDP is not thinking that way. Trust me, they are not. They are just waiting for APC to say south or southwest or southeast. And then they will go and do their math. And they're like, what do we do to win? That is going to be the conversation of PDP. This issue of, because APC is, is moral bound, moral bound, and their own constitution bound to go south. And they'll find it difficult to do otherwise. But PDP can say, you know, all our candidates, you know, have been from south, you know. So let us, apart from Yaradwa, you know, a little bit, but just a few, a few months, that um, Obasanjo was south, you know, Jonathan was south. All our candidates have been south. Why don't we also pick north? Do you understand me? They can have that argument. And they can, if they have smart people, they can they can actually pull, push that narrative. And then they look for one Northerner that can get the 10 million that Wahari has been having. You know, the whether it's mythical or, or real 10 million, I don't know. So they don't look and then they put them in the pocket, go to the southwest, look for somebody to bargain and get, and then come to southeast and get somebody like um, if I may call a name, Peter Obi or Mogalu, you understand me, to pay with the others. And the maths looks good, and they are in for, for a right. They win election. And then that is it. An election is about numbers. It's not about sentiment. So I think that we are yet to hear the last from PDP. And if they are thinking like I think they are thinking, they are still like flying kites here and there and distracting until when they can then strike. But I hope that they, they will go south as well, so that the third force will now look for a Nigerian and that will, um, you know, Absolutely. seal the show. <laughs> well, let, let, qu quickly also, um, this is not on the papers this morning, but I want you to share your thoughts on the um, Pandora Papers, if you've been following the uh, Pandora Papers discussion in the last few days and uh, the, um, you know, releases that have, have been coming out. Uh, what are your thoughts and what do you think this might achieve? As a nation, I doubt that it will achieve much. You would realize that I, I have not been following your conversation, but um, generally, in the past, names have come out and nothing has happened. For instance, you would realize that I think Saraki has been there, uh, Desiani has been there in the past. Our government don't think that way. That is why even the sponsors of Boko Haram, that the UAE was able to say something about, our people don't think that way. They don't think governance. They don't think patriotism. They don't think essence. They think politics. Everything is about politics. If there is just one person in the ruling party that is reflected there, and it is public, that person becomes the saving grace of everybody. They just push everything under the carpet. Because they're like, oh, if you touch it, it will affect our election. They just think about election. Election is what, and I think the media really needs to come to enlighten us on what governance is all about. It bothers me. So I don't think that, you know, it would just be a media thing. We'll talk about it and, you know, one of those talking points and then leave it and move on. In Nigeria, trust me, nothing will happen, unfortunately. <laughs> All right. Mr. Ezekiel, yeah, I talk, thank you so much uh, for joining us this Thursday morning. And, of course, I wish you a very interesting day ahead. Thank you, sir. Good morning once again. Stay with us. When we come back, we'll take a, a you know, a little bit uh, back in history. And, of course, we're going back to the year 1960. Pretty short uh, discussion on today in history, uh, where Nigeria did join the United Nations. I'll tell you a little bit about that when we come back from this break. Stay with us.